Um, I'm Matthew Bales. I'm um, currently a Pro Vice Chancellor at Swinburne University of Technology um, for Research, and I'm the dynamic theme leader for the Castro project. The dynamic universe is a really new area of astronomy because we haven't had the capability to monitor the sky on a large scale for very long. Um, the Moore's law that gives rise to the wonderful advances in computing instrumentation is also sort of applicable to astronomy in some sense. And so the amount of sky that we can capture at any point um, is getting better and better as, as new instruments come online and our ability to process the incredible amounts of information from the sky has also got a lot better. Um, there's new instruments being built in Perth, one's called the MWA, another one is ASCAP, that's Australia's SKA, or Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, and they're going to be very different than the radio telescopes we're used to. Um, Parks when it looks at the sky, it looks at a little patch which is only about one degree across. Um, the MWA, every time it gazes at the sky, will do a patch that's like 30 degrees by 30 degrees. And this is really um, revolutionary for astronomy and will enable us to be able to quickly do a survey of the whole sky, or at least the southern part of it, and look for things that are changing. Um, and so the dynamic universe is really about what's, what's changing. ASCAP is a little bit um, further out, but it's um, at a much higher frequency and it uses a very clever technology called focal plane arrays to be able to look at a 30 degree square um, patch of sky. And it will be able to survey the whole sky at much higher frequencies with, with better resolution on the sky and should reveal a, a new population of the changing radio sky. And then over in, on the other side of the country, um, in, in New South Wales, at Siding Spring, we have the SkyMapper telescope. And Brian Schmidt's leading a, a program on that telescope to look at the sky in the optical domain. And so it's a really wonderful collaboration that's going to bring together the very low radio frequencies, the, um, the higher radio frequencies, and then the optical um, light to really be able to determine what the state of the universe is on reasonably short timescales. Uh, astronomers are used to sort of making plates of the sky once every decade or something. Um, we'll be able to sort of map the sky you know, every night and it'll, it'll be fantastic to bring all those scientists and that data together. Yeah, so we were fortunate that we had um, one project um, which is the High Time Resolution Universe Survey, already underway when Castro, Castro began, and it sort of adopted that. So that project's been, been running. Most of the other um, projects in Castro are relying on these new instruments. And so I wouldn't say we've got a commissioning role in those projects, but I, I would say that um, we're gearing ourselves up at the moment be able to put those telescopes to use as soon as they are sort of released by the engineers. And I, I think it's a little bit, it's not really like some instruments where from day one they work. I, I think um, it would be unwise to sort of think we're going to sit back and do nothing until they declare they're ready. I think there's going to be a, an area of, where, of time when you know, we're trying to use it and finding bugs and reporting them to the engineers and then having another go and there'll be a kind of bootstrap procedure where we end up um, I don't think we're ever going to sort of say oh, there's a point in time where the machine the instruments finished I think we're going to use it as soon as we can and, and help in that um, commissioning and that a lot of the the radio instruments have commonality in um, the way they're going to have to try and work out whether a source is changing or not. So the dynamic universe is not about learning about what doesn't change. It's more about what, learning about what does change. And um, we have to be very wary of what we call false positives. If some instrumental glitch makes us think something's happened. Um, 
but also going to have to be very wary of man-made interference and how that might mimic things that change. And then what might actually be the biggest impediment to the project is a lot of the things that change in the sky might be very boring. Um, so we're going to need to um, learn how to distill uh, the wheat from the chaff. And I think that's actually uh, one of the, the unknowns. We don't really know how many um, interesting sources that are there they're going to be for every kind of boring one that changes. So we know the intergalactic and interstellar medium are going to focus the radio light in, in various ways that will make things that aren't really changing appear to change. And so that'll be more about studying the interstellar medium than, than studying the sources. And um, what we really want, we want to see stars blowing up and stars being ripped apart, black holes eating things. Um, but we don't want to have to look at a thousand boring things for every one interesting one. So that's quite exciting because we don't know what we're going to find. And uh, you're always better off doing astronomy in patches of phase space that nobody's looked at than just repeating a survey that, that somebody did in another hemisphere or with a different telescope. To me, one of the, the most challenging things will be are there sources of radio emission um, that we can use as a cosmological probe? Um, if, if it was possible to identify the redshift of a, um, a star or an event that gave off a prompt radio burst and it travelled through the intergalactic medium. If we could measure the redshift to that and we could um, look at how the, the radio waves propagate and are delayed, we could actually work out how many electrons and protons there are in the whole universe, kind of weigh it, which would be, which would be fun. Um, there's a series of um, or a class of objects which are called the X-ray transients and these are, uh, are objects that every now and then um, flare up in the X-rays and there's usually associated radio emission. At the moment we're very um, dependent on the X-ray people telling us um, when, when these things occur but the radio might actually be a better way to find these things. And um, things like the MWA and ASCAP might be great at finding these things. Um, similarly, um, when there's a supernova, we know that there's radio emission usually delayed by, by some time. It'd be nice to know if there's a burst of prompt radio emission as well, and um, whether that's visible at, at some frequencies. Um, and by a curious uh, kind of quirk of fate, um, the radio waves, when they travel through the universe, the, the high frequency waves arrive before the low frequency waves. So we'll be able to do these kind of cute experiments where Parks will be looking at a patch of sky, and if it thinks it sees a pulse, it will be able to send over the internet a message to the MWA. It'll say, we think you should look in this direction. And we might be able to see the same pulse delayed by five or ten seconds. And that'll tell us about um, the intervening material, um, how much of it there is, and um, will be quite fun. <laughs> um, because normally, in you know, survey, we just look somewhere, and if you see something, you see something. You don't usually get warnings. There's also um, things like gamma ray bursts, where bursts of gamma rays sort of wash through the solar system, and we have satellite-borne detectors, and those detectors give out event alerts. You know, in that direction, there was a burst of gamma rays. Uh, we should be able to grab um, the MWA um, and electronically steer it in that direction and see if there's, there's a burst of radio emission or not. So I think um, that's very exciting. And it's also very flexible in that um, my colleagues in the sort of dark and evolving universes are um, 
trying to see the epoch of reionization. Um, and they're actually looking for very static structures that were formed you know, shortly after the Big Bang in radio emission. And it's incredible that a lot of these experiments can use the same instrument to do two you know, very different things. You've got, um, we're looking for bubbles in the um, intergalactic medium formed by quasars you know, billions of, year, of years ago that are massive structures and we're also looking for neutron stars that are only 20 kilometers across and giving off bursts of radio emission that might only last for a few nanoseconds. So these, it's incredible that within Castro we're dealing with events that go from nanoseconds to kind of giga years.